So we say we want kids to be fluent in math, but what does that actually look like? I'm Christina Tonneval, the Recovering Traditionalist, and today we're going to take a look at students with math fluency in our quest to build our math minds so we can build the math minds of our kiddos. We think fluency looks like this, but this can often be what my friend Mike Flynn calls an illusion of understanding. The kids can get the right answer, but are they really understanding what's going on? And as soon as we extend that problem, we see that oh, they only have a surface level of understanding. Now, in prior videos in this series, I've talked about how we define fluency, but in this video, I'd like you to actually see examples of kids with fluency. Now remember, fluency is not just being fast and accurate. It is also about being a flexible thinker. I go into more detail about that in the prior videos in this series. So if you haven't watched those, make sure that you go watch those. The link is right here where you're watching it somewhere. It's in the description, it's down below you'll see it. We also have a fluency starter kit that goes into a whole lot more detail to give you information about how to build this for your students. And the link is on, that vi on the video series page. Now there are lots of ways that kids can show that they are flexible and fluent thinkers, but I'm gonna share with you my top five. These five things are things that I personally, personally look for in my own children to ensure that they are fluent in math. And all the videos that I'm gonna show you of kids are my own personal kids because it's easy to get the parental permission to use their, their faces in videos. So our first key thing that I look for is that they use what they know about small quantities to help them with larger quantities. This video that I'm gonna show you is of my oldest son when he was in first grade. And I was working on a presentation of a number string. So it's a string of related problems. And I just thought, he's sitting next to me. I know he could do the first one. He was in first grade at the time. And once I saw how he did the first one, and then I showed him the next one, the second one, and I'm like, oh, I got to get this on camera. So I grabbed my phone and I started recording how he would solve that this third problem. So take a listen. What do you think? There I guess. I think it's 646. How in the world did you get that? I added these two up, and that's 500, and then subtract one from the six, and add it here, that's 600, and then all we have left, no, it's 45, 645, because I forgot, I took one away from that and put it over here, and that would equal, out of these three, 599, and then we took one away from the six, That'd be five for the six, and that'd be 600 for the 599, and then I just had to add the 45. So now just to remind everybody, that is not a problem that a first grader should be solving. Most first grade standards only talk about taking a two digit plus a, another two digit that's a multiple of 10. So like doing 27 plus 20 would be a first grade standard. That problem he solved is not a first grade standard. So it's not something you would expect a first grader to be able to do. But what's powerful there is that kids who have this fluency and flexibility that is a, the, the basis of fluency can use how they solve small numbers. So they've built that fluency around their facts, which is one of the other videos that we talked about. How they solve those problems impacts how they solve bigger quantities as they go forward. That is a sign of students who are fluent with math. Our second one, which you kind of saw in that first video, but I wanna show you another example. Our second one is that they are able to solve problems that they haven't ever seen before. This video that I'm gonna show you is my youngest son, it was just filmed here recently, um, that 
he, we were playing the game Farkle and the video you're actually going to watch is a recreation because when we were actually playing Farkle, I, we don't have our phones. I wasn't like filming stuff. We were just playing. Um, but I, I was so amazed at what I saw happening during that game. I had to have him recreate it basically. So he wanted to be the scorekeeper. And if you've ever played Farkle, you are adding amounts up to 10,000. He's in first grade and, and he's a young first grader. He, his birthday is in the summer. So he is a very young kid for his class. So this is not something that I was like, oh, okay, this should be easy. Like having my fifth grader be the scorekeeper, no problem. But my first grader wanting to be the scorekeeper, I was a little hesitant. So I thought, okay, I'll give him the paper. I'll let him do it the first round where people are just getting, you know, things in the hundreds. And all he has to do is just write down the number. He's not adding hundreds and hundreds together, you know? So we start going and he is adding the hundreds together and he's adding them when it's like weird amounts. And then we get into where we're working in the thousands and he added this amount together and I was amazed. <laughs> it was crazy. So let's take a look and watch it in his own thinking here. This was one of the problems. Somebody had 2,650 as their score and they rolled 850 points. Can you tell me how you would figure that out? Uh. 450, wait, is it 450? I don't know, you tell me. What are you trying to do? Three hundred fifty, and then I have, and then I have five hundred, four hundred and fifty left, and then I add the one, the three fifty to it. Okay, so how'd you get to the 3,000? 350. Okay, and they scored 850. Now I need 500 more. So how much would their score be now? 300 and 500. 3,500. 3,500. Nice thinking, dude. You're a first grader. Like that, <laughs> that should not be the way that kids in first grade, like that's not what we expect first graders. And like, I was telling my mom this story. I'm like, like in first grade, we're excited if a kid writes down 250 just correctly and not 20050, right? Like <laughs> that, that's a big accomplishment sometimes in first grade is to just get them to write numbers in the hundreds and thousands correctly, not be able to add and subtract those amounts. But they, he wasn't, it's not like he's ever been taught that before. He's using his understanding of numbers, his flexibility, his number sense, and applying it to a new situation that he's never seen before. Again, that's the power of building fluency for our kids. All right, number three. This one is, it seems obvious to me because I do it all the time. And there's a lot of people who don't. So number three is all about that kids will see math all around them. They see the mathematical problems that appear in their daily lives. And not every child sees the math in their daily lives. So this video was when we were at a drive-thru at a coffee, my favorite coffee shop, shout out to Dutch Brothers. Um, but I had ordered a bunch of smoothies for our big family. And at the time I was only buying stuff with cash. I carried cash with me to buy groceries, everything. So all I had when we were in the coffee drive up was a hundred dollar bill. And my son saw this problem on his own 
And so you're gonna watch the problem he came up with and how he figured it out. That out. Um, my mom was buying some smoothies for fifteen dollars, and she didn't have anything less than a hundred. So if they'll take the hundred, she would get eighty-five back. And how I figured that out was I went. 110 back then 100 would be 90 then five more would be 15 then five more back would be 85. Cool strategy dude. So again this one is all about helping kids see math all around them not just inside of a textbook. Fluent mathematicians don't see math as a problem to solve they see math as the vehicle to solve problems in their lives. Okay, number four. What I look for is that they use problems they know to help them with problems they don't. So you've seen that kind of throughout all of these videos pretty much, but here's another example of one of my other sons. He was working on a worksheet that was sent home and he was seeing connections between problems and he was telling me about it. Well, his younger son was a kindergartner at the time and was sitting at the table and was catching on to what he was seeing. And so I wanted to video to see, cause he was like, I'm gonna solve this next one. So I videoed what he saw in these problems. Here you go. What do you think this last one is? <coughs> 68. Why do you think it's 68? Because this one has 20, and this one has 19. He's correct. Well, so how does, what Freaking do you mean correct. Because this one only has 49, and this one has 49. But this one is one less. That one has one less, so the answer is going to be one less, you think? Yes. So in this one, I just want to remind you that so many of our kids will see math problems as individual tasks to solve, individual problems. They are not seeing connections between them. So one of the big parts of kids being truly fluent in mathematics is they see this interconnectedness. All right, our last one is that you've, again, probably seen this all throughout, but I'm gonna make the point, is that they decompose and compose numbers. So basically this means they're breaking numbers apart to make them into friendlier amounts, and they're able to put them back together. This video was when we were um, shopping out at the grocery store, and we buy a lot of Gatorades. We have four kids, all of them are in sports, like all the time, and so we buy a lot of Gatorade. <laughs> And you can see it there in the cart. So I'd ask them how, I'd ask them all how they solved it. And my daughter was this, I looked back, it was the spring of her third grade year. So she was towards the end of her third grade year. And this is how she figured out how many Gatorades we were buying. So I know these are 10, so I'm going to leave those out. These are 10, so I'm going to leave those out. I'm going to leave those out because those are 10. So two, four, six. Then 10, 20, 30. So 30 plus 6 is 36. So you broke it up so that there was 10 in each? Yes. And the 2 from each. So basically, that problem was 3 times 12. But she decomposed it and she saw three groups of two, like the two on each of the ends of, of the Gatorades, and then the groups of 10. That is such powerful thinking that moves into the distributive property for multiplication and will serve her greatly when she starts moving into algebraic reasoning stuff. So all of this stuff, the decomposing, it isn't just about helping kids with their facts. It will transfer into bigger mathematical ideas as they progress through. And that's really the string that ties it all together. It, so much of math is just about getting the right answer. But the right answer is important, but how they get there is also very, very important and will impact how they perceive mathematics throughout all that they do.
So I want to encourage you to go download the starter kit that I have for you that gives you ideas about how to build this for students, what it actually is. Okay? It starts off with helping you decide, is that flexibility really important to you to help build the fluency? Because you guys are bombarded with so much that you have to teach, especially right now. You're trying to make decisions about what is really, really important. And so is building this flexibility for kids important? And if it is, I think it is, then the rest of that kit will really help you out. We talk about how to help build that for their basic facts and then activities and things that you can do to really help build this. All right. I hope that this video has helped you build your math mind so you can go build the math minds of your kiddos. Have a great day.